God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. These are the words of the madman from Nietzsche's The Joyful Pursuit of Knowledge and Understanding. And it's quite a thing to say, really. It's a big charge to level against humanity, to level against us. But the madman goes on from there. How shall we now comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers, he asks. What was the holiest and mightiest of us all that the world has yet owned, has bled to death under our knives, and who will wipe this blood from us? What water is there to clean ourselves with? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we now invent? Is not the greatness of the deed far too great for us? Must ourselves not become gods to simply appear worthy of it? Now, Nietzsche's madman, and indeed Nietzsche himself, are not arguing for atheism, qua atheism here or that we have in fact committed deicide, the murder of God. We have not in fact been able to kill God as the madmen suggest, but it ain't for lack of trying. Nietzsche's larger point here is that there is something about humanity, about our own culture that bristles over the very idea of there being a God who is sovereign in the world, of there being a God who has dominion and care over us. There is something particular that Nietzsche would say about post-enlightenment Western culture. That's our culture, in case you were wondering, that bristles at God. But there is something biblical and pre-enlightened about this bristling as well, because there's something about being human that is just uncomfortable with that. Now, in Luke's Gospel account, Jesus is crucified because of his teachings and the way it stirred things up. In Luke's Gospel account, we see an emphasis on Jesus' teaching about the poor and how we as God's people choose, or choose not, to respond to the poor and the outcast. And Jesus' teaching in Luke focuses on the freedom that his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and second coming bring about and how it is meant to change the way we live today, in the here and the now. And when the people get together to kill God, literally, in the New Testament, and to proclaim in one voice that God is dead, we have killed him, in Luke chapter 23, they do so because, quote, Jesus stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee, and he has come all the way to Jerusalem to keep it going. Now, the event that they are recalling that kicked this whole mess off was Jesus teaching in synagogue in Nazareth in Galilee right after his baptism. Check out our sermon on YouTube for the sermon on the baptism. It'll help provide some additional context for today. But Jesus returns after his baptism, after a jaunt of fasting and prayer and temptation over 40 days in the wilderness, still in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's just full up of that Holy Ghost power. And he goes to synagogue and stands up to read Torah, that is the Holy Scripture, to the people. He stands up and gets the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now, you got your Bible earlier, I hope. So turn with me to Luke chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 18. If you're wondering where Luke is, Luke is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke is the third of the gospel accounts. It'll be, you know, 65, 70%, something like that through the Bible. Luke 4, beginning at verse 18. And we're going to read what Jesus is reading to the people. Jesus unrolls the scroll. And he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of the sight for the blind, 
to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, Jesus is reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, if you're wondering where he's pulling this from in Isaiah. But what he comes to do is to proclaim good news to the poor, sight for the blind, and the year of the Lord's favor. But immediately after Jesus reads from Isaiah, he tells the people that today this reading has been fulfilled in their midst. The people become enraged. They just lose their minds. They become so angry that they chase Jesus out of the synagogue and to the top of the hill, intending to chuck him off it and to murder him right then and there. Jesus just walks through the crowd and on to Capernaum. That's the end of our saga, but it kicks off the inexplicable and unstoppable march to the cross because of this teaching that Jesus gives that stirs the people up. But it seems weird, doesn't it, to think that Jesus reading from the prophet Isaiah and proclaiming that today the blind shall see and the poor are going to get news, good news, and that prisoners are going to be free, and that captives will be set free, and that it's going to be the year of the Lord's favor, would make people so enraged that they're driven to deicide. But it is precisely this good news that Jesus is proclaiming from Isaiah, and claiming that it is being fulfilled in his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and second coming, that leads to the murderous crucifixion in Luke 23, and it is the same news that Jesus gives today that drives us into a similar deicidal murderous rage, leading to Nietzsche's madman to proclaim God is dead, he remains dead, and we've killed him. It is Jesus' statement and work that leads us to try to make ourselves gods instead. You see, Jesus' proclamation and fulfillment of this good news through his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and second coming is so infuriating because of how he's going to accomplish it. Jesus is going to do all of this by setting the oppressed free with the perpetual year of the Lord's favor. It sounds nice unless you know the history and what it means. The year of the Lord's favor is the year of Jubilee, demanded by Torah and Leviticus 25, Verses 1 to 13, we are going to jump there next. Don't worry, I'll help you find it. Now, this is going to get a little bit technical, but stay with me, because this is the reason that Jesus gets crucified in Luke's account. This is the reason, ultimately, I would argue, that Nietzsche's critique of the modern world cuts so deep for us. This is the reason that we attempt ourselves to kill God and to become gods. You see, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we see when God creates the heavens and the earth, God creates over six days. And on the seventh day, God rests. And in Leviticus 25, we see that this pattern of work and rest, work and Sabbath, continues and it is extended from a weekly practice of six days of labor, one day of Sabbath, to an annual practice of six years of planting and harvesting and labor, and one year of Sabbath, and to a super Sabbath, a week of weeks, so that every 50 years there are 49 years of labor, and one year of Sabbath. And that 50th year is the year of Jubilee. But the 50th year is to be a holy year for the people, and it means a big shift in the way they live. The Jubilee is the year of the Lord's favor that Jesus comes to proclaim, and it's supposed to be different this time for God's people because it is meant to be a perpetual jubilee. 
Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 25. We're going to start at verse 10. Leviticus is in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the Numbers. So it's the third book of the Bible. It will be pretty close to the beginning. I'm going to say it's like 10, 15% through, something like that. But not very far in. Leviticus chapter 10. Now listen to this. Consecrate the 50th year. And proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. For it is a jubilee. It is to be holy for you. Eat only what can be taken directly from the fields. And in this year of Jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. So right from the beginning, we see that in the Jubilee year, there's no planting, there's no harvesting. You don't even get to harvest the stuff that just grows by itself. You are required to trust that God is going to provide instead of your own agency and work and like what you're going to be able to do. So there is already a departure from kind of like the way we know things are supposed to work in our lives and in the world. But it goes on and it gets worse slash better depending on your point of view. In this year of Jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. If you sell any of your land to people or buy land from them, do not take advantage of one another. In Hebrew, it's literally, don't take a bite out of your brother. Don't hurt them. You are to buy from your own people on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee, and they are to sell to you on the basis of the number of years left for harvesting crops. When the years are many, you are to increase the price, and when the years are few, you decrease the price. Because what is really being sold to you is the number of crops. Do not take advantage of each other. Don't bite each other. But fear, respect your God. I am the Lord your God. Follow my decrees and be careful. Obey my laws and you will live in safety. The lamb will yield its fruit and you will eat your fruit and live. Right away we see that this jubilee then requires a reshuffling of the economic order. This reshuffling is meant to keep people from being ground down and destroyed or locked into intergenerational poverty. How is this going to work? Well, the Lord tells people, don't be anxious about how that is going to work. On the sixth year, there is going to be a super abundant harvest. The Lord is going to give that to you. And you will eat from that until you eat and plant in the eighth year. And you will continue to eat on that until the harvest comes in in the ninth year. It is to be that kind of radical reshuffling. The land belongs to God. The wealth belongs to God. And God gives us what we need out of it. And in the Jubilee, all the slaves and servants are set free. Captives are released, and the land goes back to the ownership that God divvied up in the story of Exodus, when people finally possessed the promised land. But this super Sabbath year, this jubilee, is a scary thing. It's so scary that secretly it was probably never really implemented Though the year of Jubilee is demanded and required in Torah, there is really very little evidence that it was ever really implemented amongst God's people. The year of Jubilee, as proclaimed in Leviticus and affirmed by Jesus in Luke 4, is scandalous and it is scary because it seeks to set you free. It seeks to set me free so that we can, having been freed by Jesus, set others on the pathway to freedom and 
relationship with him. We are set free so that through the way we choose to live our lives and conduct ourselves in the marketplace and in the world, we can set others free also. But the scandal of Jubilee and Jesus is that we are set free from the worry and the grip that our own sense of scarcity and fear and greed have on us. The scandal of Jubilee, the thing that gets Jesus murdered, is the setting free from captivity to not plant crops, to cancel debts, to set the people free, to radically commit to using your own efforts and money for the benefit of your brothers and sisters is scandalous and it is terrifying. It is scandalous and terrifying because we know, we understand this is not how the world's economy works. It's not how you get ahead, it's just wrong. It is scandalous and scary to live into the Jubilee and to follow Jesus because it means not trusting your own skill and ability or what you can do or your ingenuity or prudence, but it means fully relying upon God. It means taking God at his word that he is going to provide and handle it, as Luke will tell you to do a couple of chapters later when he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or wear or live. God cares more about the sparrows and takes care of them, well, aren't you at least as valuable to him as a sparrow? No, you're more valuable. But you see, when being faced with being set radically free like this and embracing that freedom and setting others so radically free, it somehow just seems safer to chuck Jesus and Jubilee right off that cliff. When Jesus stirs up a people yearning for that freedom, that release, that jubilee, that salvation that only Jesus can bring, it somehow just seems easier to commit day aside instead. And so Nietzsche's madman finds a space in each of our hearts. God is dead. We have killed him. Because it is easier to accept a world in which we have murdered God and set ourselves up as gods to remain in control than it is to accept the release Jesus offers. And Nietzsche's madman is in each and every one of us as we shout that God is dead and we have killed him, not with our words, because like the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, we are far too subtle and crafty to be that honest about it or to be that bold, but we do do it with our actions when we take a bite out of our brother and sisters in the way we choose to conduct ourselves in the economic place, in the way we choose to use our money and our time and our efforts. But somehow doing that is easier than accepting the release that Jesus offers and letting go of our own worry and our own attachment to money and to things and the false sense of security it purchases. God is dead. God remains dead and we have killed him in our hearts and indeed in our minds because it is somehow just easier to trust in ourselves than it is to trust in God. And so we hear that good news. And if we really get what Jesus is saying here in Luke 4, we carry him up to that cliff to chuck him off. And we shout with him in chapter 23 of Luke's gospel, crucify him. Crucify him. This is something I struggle with in my own life. This is something that every single congregation I have served over the last 15 years has struggled with in their corporate lives. This is likely something that you struggle with in your own life. And this is something that St. Michael's, my congregation now, struggles with in our life together. Now, my struggle doesn't mean that I'm a bad person or a bad priest. And your struggling doesn't mean that you're a bad person, or our congregation's struggling doesn't mean that this is a bad church. What it does mean is that we are struggling with it because we're human. And even when from time to time we lose that struggle, which we will, and we fall into the old bad habits and patterns of trusting in ourselves and our own ingenuity and our prudence, and becoming overly worried about money and how it's going to all work out. Jesus is there to set you free from the chains of sin and death that we seek to put back around our own hands and feet. 
Jesus is there. And even when we try to commit the ultimate crime of deicide in our hearts and proclaim with our actions that God is dead, he remains dead, and we have killed him, and we embrace our inner Nietzsche madman, Jesus is there. Jesus is there and proclaims to you in the power of the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and he has been anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed, you, free. Jesus is there to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that jubilee. Jesus and jubilee present themselves yet again. And today, it can be fulfilled in your life. Connect with us if you need that release and that freedom. Let's start walking that journey together. Amen. Spirit of power